I'm Ethan, I love muzzleloading, and this is the 47th annual Kalamazoo Living History Show. The Kalamazoo Living History Show welcomes more than 10,000 attendees each year from more than 18 states and Canada. The show focuses on the pre-1890 time period with people representing anything from medieval periods all the way up to the colonial era, the American Civil War, and later, all the way up to 1890. Like I've said before, this is one of my favorite shows every year. It's one of the largest shows in the United States, definitely one of the largest east of the Mississippi, and I think the vendors and the craftspeople and the businesses that were in attendance this year really stepped up their game. I mean, there's just some wonderful work all through the event halls. All three massive rooms were just jam-packed with anything that you could enjoy about everything pre-1890. Obviously our focus here is muzzleloading on this channel, but just the representation of, of quality and the passion for history and, and material culture of everybody who came before us here today was just wonderful. There were a variety of, of new vendors and craftspeople in attendance, and I think that their presence was, was very welcome. It was just nice to see that new variety, but also nice to shop from those same people that we've seen uh, come and come again over the years. Each year the show runs on a theme with presentations associating with that theme to give people an opportunity to hear from scholars and historians. This year's theme was one if by land, two if by sea, with presentations about using modern tools to reach new audiences and build community in muzzleloading and living history and history in general. Um, there were presentations from Jason Gatliff at Muzzleloader Magazine about the kinds of things that he's doing to keep Muzzleloader Magazine current and relevant in kind of our changing times. We also had Penny Wayne from Kentucky Leather and Hides talking about what she did post-COVID with all of the events being canceled and how she kept her business alive by going online and, and running a lot of online sales and, and various discussion groups to keep things going for her business and others. The third speaker was, was me actually talking a little bit about um, what the kind of things that we're doing here at I Love Muzzleloading are to um, spread the word about history and living history and, and muzzleloading specifically. If you'd like to hear my presentation, um, it came out just a week before this video, you can find it on the main channel page or at ilovemuzzleloading.com. Uh, our presentation ran a little bit long and we had an even longer Q&A session both days after the presentation. You can catch the full Q&A at ilovemuzzleloading.com as well if you're interested in some of the questions and things that folks had for me after my presentation. Overall, I really enjoyed the opportunity to get out and talk a little bit about the kind of things that I'm doing and uh, it really wasn't about necessarily what I'm doing, more so than it was uh, about the kinds of things that you all can do to get involved in, in your local muzzleloading or living history community. Uh, I try to provide some, some tools and things to help you grow your clubs and the muzzleloading and living history items and, and events in your area. So if that's the kind of thing that you're interested in, check out that and, uh, and reach out, of course, if you have any questions. Overall, the show this year felt like there was some good attendance. We did have some gnarly weather on Saturday. It seemed like every half hour, the weather would rotate from a snow whiteout to a beautiful sunny day and everything in between. That weather, the weather conditions combined with some major accidents because of the weather on the local interstate highways 
uh, really change the flow of, of the crowd and the traffic through the event. Um, but a lot of folks that I talked to were just happy to be there, happy to make it to the event and be able to shop. And, uh, and the same kind of thing came from the vendors and the craftspeople at the show. Everybody noticed the change in traffic patterns, but it seemed like everybody was very understanding that the weather kind of caught us a little bit off guard as far as, as I saw it there on um, just how quickly it could change. It was really something else when you looked outside one of the windows. It'd be sunny one minute and then just be a total blizzard whiteout the next minute. Um, but really it was nice to be inside and, and hanging out and chatting with, with other muzzleloading and, and living history enthusiasts. It's hard to get out and film the entire show at a show this size, but I wanna say that kalamazooshow.com slash links has links to many of the vendors, associations, publishers, and reference sites that work with and, and are at the show. So I encourage you to check that out. You also have the opportunity to chat with the event staff and vendors and other attendees of the show at the Kalamazoo Living History Show Facebook group, which we'll also link that in the description of this video for you to check out if that's the kind of thing that you're interested in.
Going into an event like this, as always, I like to save up a little bit from the paychecks whenever I can to go around and purchase a few things for my own kit and, um, you know, just to add some stuff to the collection. When you go to a show like this, it's hard not to take something home. Uh, so I've got my little bag of goodies here. I'll kind of walk you through a little bit. First up, I picked up this really cute little axe from H&B Forge. I saw him post these on Instagram before he went to a show over in Marietta, Ohio, and uh, asked him if he had some at Kalamazoo, and he did, so I, I was really happy to pick this up. It's really just kind of a novelty thing. It's going to just kind of sit on my desk, you know, but just a neat little, just a neat little axe. Uh, it's got a curly maple handle there with a little oil on it. Just a really nice piece of craftsmanship there. And then I had this dropped off uh, from Matt at Neanderthal Nonsense here on YouTube. He napped this beautiful little point for me. Um, and I'm just going to put this on a little display case here in the house. It's just a beautiful example of, of flint napping. And it just, it's a skill and a trade that I don't know that I'll ever understand how it works, but um, I can appreciate the execution of this. So thanks, man. That's really neat. And then I've been hunting one of these for a little while because I've been shooting out of so many different powder cans and things. I needed another one. Um, this is a powder can valve that accommodates a powder measure here at the top. So you can mount this through a powder can lid. Uh, really some of the old metal powder cans really is what I'm going for with this. Um, and then you have just a nice spring loaded valve here. You place your powder measure in this end. You can fill your powder measure, tip it back over and you've got everything nice and contained here. Mike Eater at Flintlocks LLC hooked me up with this. I've been bugging him about one for a few months now, so I'm glad we could finally connect on, on getting one. Thank you, Mike. Then I picked up this cute little spice gourd from Daryl Lang. Uh, he makes these, and, and we hear a lot about spice horns or salt horns being carried in kind of a historic trekking kit. And this is just a neat take on that, I think. We've got a nice little cork here at the top, it's got some uh, like hemp cord here wrapped around it and it's been carved with spice on here. I'm probably going to put a salt and pepper mixture in here for when I'm out hiking or something. Um, just a neat little item to add to the kit. I love these tiny gourds. Um, Daryl makes these and, and marks them with salt and pepper. Uh, I just really liked the shape of this one and, uh, and wanted to add it to my kit. Daryl also had, a, a, you probably saw in the video, some nice bags and, and other small accoutrements and things. but. Something a little odd and end like this, I just love picking up because it's easy to stick in my pocket and it just adds a little bit of flavor to what I'm wearing, you know, when I'm out in historic gear. And then kind of a curiosity really here, I picked up this carved finger from Cousin Dave's Silversmithing. This is made out of a deer antler tine, but he carves these up to look like a finger uh, and he drills a hole in here so you could wear it like a necklace if you wanted to or hang it off of a bag or a horn. Um, don't really know what I'm going to do with this yet, um, but I, I saw my buddy Chuck had one of these and I had to ask him where I got it. I had to add it to my kit, you know, it's kind of a carryover from kind of the rendezvous days, maybe, uh, but just something neat that I just had to add. So <laughs> cousin Dave, thanks man. This is a really neat thing and I'm, I'm happy to add it to my kit. Just kind of that odd curiosity here and there. And then I picked up this Carolina Wren print from Ken Scott. I've talked to Ken on the podcast and things, and we've showed his work here in the event tours over the years. Just really like Ken's naturalist work, and I'm a big fan of the Carolina Wrens. I know that when the Wrens show up here on the farm, that spring is officially here, and I'm not really too worried about winter coming back. Um, as of recording here, the wrens aren't back yet, so we're still in the drudges of a late winter, it feels like here. But I'm, I'm happy to add this to the wall and, and some of the art on the wall here so that I think about spring and, and I think about Ken really every time I walk by it. So I'd like to thank Ken for that and uh, just had to show it off here in the video. I did have one carry over from the Connor show. I forgot about it because I'd already been using it by the time I got to recording the video, but I picked up this leather wallet from Dwight Galleon. Uh, if you know Dwight, you know he's a little bit ornery. Uh, when I saw him have this wallet on his table at the Connor show, I just had to pick it up. I've been carrying this kind of faux leather wallet for a little while because it worked with, you know, the attire that I had to wear to work and things. Um, but seeing this on, on Dwight's table, I just had to pick it up and take it home. And it's really worked great as a daily driver. 
since the Connor show, and I'm, I'm really pleased with how it's kind of aging in uh, with that continual daily use. So Dwight, I'm really sorry about not getting that in the Connor video, um, but we've got it in here for you. That's all really for me from the Kalamazoo Living History Show. It's kind of a light show for me on, on picking stuff up. We're saving up for a few extra things uh, for the channel here, um, but still happy to add this stuff to the kit and kind of the to, to the displays that we keep in the shop or in the house of the artwork here. If you're looking forward to and want to mark your calendars for next year's Kalamazoo Living History Show, it will be March 16th and 17th, 2024. I encourage you to put this one on your calendars. If you need an event to go to as a one-stop shop, the Kalamazoo Living History Show is the show for you. You can pick up everything you need for a new persona, a new interest, all in one weekend from a bunch of great people, and you're supporting a wonderful show and a wonderful group of uh, both volunteer event staff and the vendors and craftspeople and businesses that make it all happen. It is truly a wonderful event to go to and to be a part of. I can't thank the Yankee Doodle muzzleloaders enough for inviting me in to talk a little bit about muzzleloading. If you have any questions about this or anything else related to muzzleloading, please shoot me an email at ilovemuzzleloading at gmail.com. I'm Ethan, I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time.